All right, Jordan. So welcome to the show. Many of you know, we know you by many, many names. So Doc G back in the, the, the days of old and, uh, and, and Jordan, you know, as a, as a friend is how I know you. So couldn't be more excited to have you here. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Yeah, Jimmy, you and I started way back in the back in the olden days of blogging about personal finance. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's funny. We've even we shared a hotel room at a, at a personal finance conference. You know what happened in the hotel room stays in the hotel room. But uh, yeah, now I'm excited. I'm excited to talk about this, man. We're we're going to talk about your book today and a lot of the ideas in there, and and you tell a lot about your story um, in your book. And I really got to know, you know, some things about you and your background that I think were just so enlightening, refreshing, and like your perspective was was really great. And and I'll be honest with you, I, I read this book because you're a friend of mine, and I was like, sure, I'll, you know, I'll read your book. I got a book too. You want to read my book? Yes, you know, so we kind of like traded books. But then, like, I what I didn't expect was to read this book and to need it personally, you know, like, and and that's where I found myself when I was reading this book. But for those that don't know you. Do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, your backstory, you know, and how a personal finance blogger uh, started writing a book about life and death and money and, and, and all the rest? So it starts way back when I was a little kid. I idolized my father. I wanted to be just like him. He was an oncologist or cancer doctor. And then he had a brain aneurysm and died suddenly when I was seven years old. And it was the time where I idolized him. I wanted to be just like him. And that made concrete in me this idea that I would step into his footsteps and become a physician just like him, which wasn't a for sure thing. I had a learning disability at the time. It was very questionable whether I was going to take the normal path, much less the hyper difficult path of becoming a physician. But I got over my learning disability and I, like an arrow, shot straight through high school and college and to medical school. It was the only thing I ever considered doing. And so I went to residency and became a doctor. And in some ways, being a doctor was exactly what I wanted. I got to help people. I got to be part of people's lives. I got to be part of complex decision making. But I also suffered through a lot of what many of my colleagues have. There's the post-traumatic stress disorder of residency and watching people die and feeling helpless and being a part of a system that has its own means and ends, which don't necessarily take into account our needs as physicians, but also our patients' needs. Mm. And so I found myself at the bottom of the well of burnout, feeling like medicine was such a part of my identity, but also feeling like there was this other part of me that was so important. I like to write. I like to tell stories. I like to communicate and public speak. All these things that I had told myself you can never do those for a living. It's being a doctor that you do for a living. And those are the the things you do as hobbies or in those few spare hours that you have left. I was looking for a way out because I wasn't enjoying medicine anymore. And that's when I turned to personal finance. I started asking that important question. How much money do I need to free myself of this thing that I thought was my identity, but now it's causing me all sorts of stress I was lucky enough to be the child of parents who were very savvy financially. So they modeled all sorts of great teaching and knowledge to me. So I owned real estate. I owned stocks and bonds. I knew how to make money. I knew how to save. But they never gave me the vocabulary around things like financial independence. And this guy named Jim Dolly in 2014 called me and asked me to review his book for my medical blog at the time. And so I read his book, The White Coat Investor, and it finally gave me the vocabulary I never had had before. And I realized that not only was there a number, something that I could try to achieve that would allow me to pull back from medicine, but that I was already there. And so this got me extremely interested in personal finance, but from an odd and angle, because you would have thought when I realized I had enough money to be okay so that I could leave medicine. This burnout was really getting to me. It was making me feel so sad and it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life anymore. But instead I got really anxious and depressed because, well, who then am I? I mean, I had lived this beautiful story about my father's death and my becoming his replacement. I had built this identity around being a physician and all of a sudden in one fell swoop, I could get rid of all of that. And that left this big, empty place. I knew I liked writing. I knew I liked public speaking. I knew I liked personal finance. 
but I hadn't yet really soaked those in as part of my identity. And so the next year or two was really spent writing, thinking, and putting together my thoughts about what I wanted to be, who I wanted to be, what is my purpose in life, and, and how do I identify? So I didn't leave work right away. In fact, I slowly left work as I became more confident in how I wanted to define myself. And what I learned is that I wanted to define myself as a communicator, someone who writes, someone who podcasts, someone who public speaks, someone who's passionate about personal finance. So that became the identity that fit me much more comfortably than the one that I was getting burned out from. And so I started to transition my life with the one exception that the part of medicine that still really stuck and resonated with me, the one thing that I would do, even if you weren't paying me to do it, was to be a hospice physician. Mm. So I was able to whittle away all those things that didn't fit, hold on to being a hospice physician and do it in a way that was very good for me, right? I could control my hours. I wasn't on call very much. I didn't have to worry about nights and weekends. So I could hold on to that part of my identity, which still rang true, but then just started to explore other parts of who I was. And that led me to personal finance and podcasting and to writing this book. Man, I, I just love so I think that's why I like the book so much, Jordan, is, is that that we just share so much in common. And I feel like you're just, you know, a little bit further along in that journey on, you know, finding your purpose and your identity outside of medicine than honestly than I am. And so as I'm reading this book, I'm like, you know, like, like riding your coattails a, a little bit, you know, as you're thinking through this, and I feel like you're saving me some of the work that I probably have already been doing, you know, I cut back a couple of days a week and then started having similar questions when I all of a sudden realized I have the financial freedom to do that. But then now I have five days of the week. What do I do with my time? Who am I? Right. And you ask that, who then am I, if I'm not a you know doctor practicing the way that you had your entire life? And so, but you do mention your work, you know, in, in hospice and palliative medicine and, and you kind of make the case that mortality can sometimes, uh, you know, bring a lot of clarity. And I found this really interesting because as an anesthesiologist, I see death, but I see death from a very different perspective. It's very quick. It's very finite. It's very, you know, very acute when I see it. But your, your perspective on this is, is, is different. And you talk about the clarity that that brings that when facing our mortality, it can help us understand the importance of living before it's too late. So, so talk to me about that and how, how your, your work in medicine has, has impacted that, that thought process. Well, let's think about it. Like when you find out that you have a set amount of time to live, let's say it's weeks or months, even if it's years, you often are going to look back at your life and start reviewing. What did I do? What didn't I do? What worked? What didn't work? And often people think about regrets. And I'll tell you, after taking care of thousands of hospice patients, almost no one regrets that they didn't work harder, that they didn't spend more nights and weekends at the office. Almost no one regrets. I, you know, I have this goal of, of reaching a network net worth of 2 million and I only made it to 1.5. Yeah. Like those are just not the conversations we end up having. So the gift of my job is I get to help people come to terms with the fact that they're dying and not only deal with their physical symptoms, but deal with their social and emotional symptoms and impact that this knowledge is going to have on the rest of their life. So we think of someone gets a hospice diagnosis, it's over. No, they get the hospice diagnosis and we define that it will be over at some point, but then they're living every single moment and every single day till they get to that point. My goal is to help them use those minutes and hours well. And after doing this for long enough, and then on the other side, studying personal finance, it really hit me. I spend all this time helping people in the last six months using their moments and seconds and hours well. Why aren't we thinking just as carefully when we're 20 or 30 or 50 as we do when we're told we have only six months left? And my answer is because we're scared. I, I think we're scared of dying and it's a little bit circular, but I think we're scared of dying. And when we start thinking about the deeper stuff like purpose and identity, you have to come to terms with the fact that life is finite and I may never get there. And so instead of dealing with that, a lot of us shoot for these false goals that are easier and definable 
because they're less scary. So for me, money and net worth was exactly that. Like, in a sense, it might be hard to say I want to be worth however many million dollars, but it's easy to conceptualize what it will take to get there. Like, I have to invest this much. I have to work this many hours. I have to make this much per hour. I need this much return on my money. Those are all basic things you can conceptualize. And so I think of that as the low-hanging fruit. And I think in life, we use the low-hanging fruit to soothe us from the much scarier, bigger things that unfortunately for a lot of my patients, it's being given a terminal diagnosis that finally gives them permission to say, well, if not now, then when? Uh. And so I'm just trying to get people to say that earlier. If not now, then when? Why not start living that life now? And I mean, I can give concrete examples, right? Even when it comes to simple things like career, if I had realized all these things before I reached my net worth goal, instead of waiting till after, right? So I had a false goal and I kept on telling myself, I can't do what I want until I make a certain amount of money. Then I'm going to start thinking about purpose and identity. Let's say I had taken my own advice from the book and started thinking about these things much earlier. I probably would have done hospice work as a full-time job coming out of residency. Mm. I probably wouldn't have burned out. I mean, I probably would have found a way. And if I was getting too tired of working 50 or 40 hours a week, I probably would have said, well, my financial needs are such, I can work 30 hours a week. And so I won't retire at 50. I'll retire at 65. But you know what? I'm going to be liking those years so much more. I'll probably want to work till 70 or 75 because I'm going to like what I'm doing because I didn't burn out, because I scheduled my time, my resources, and my abilities in such a way that it actually fit my identity and purpose. I just want us to start thinking about these things earlier and being more intentional. Yeah, I love it. And, and you actually give some language to some of that. I mean, you talk about you know, financial independence, of course, but you talk about coast-fi and slow-fi. And, um, and, and I, I found it really interesting because you know, I'd, I'd run across you know, some of these terms living in the same kind of space. But you know that's that's exactly what I did. I cut back to two days a week. Now now I figured out that wasn't enough, so I'm I'm at three now. But uh, you know I uh, yeah, and and so hearing that kind of validated a lot of the thought processes that have been going through my head as I struggle with this in my mid thirties. You know this kind of like my identity and purpose. But you talk about financial independence in a really interesting way, and I think that this is really important because you just mentioned it. Like if I had found hospice, you know, work sooner in terms of like what you really enjoyed you may never have burned out. And there are so many doctors who, you know, clamor for financial independence, right? And they think that, you know, ultimately, you know, making it to that number is going to be what makes them happy. And I'm curious, what would you say to people who view work as bad and financial independence and retirement as like this penultimate goal? Because you've got a really interesting take on on that relationship. Well, you know, I always say that we're going to be working our whole lives whether we're doing it for money or not. So we say we're doing work for money. We have a boss maybe or not, and therefore it's bad. Yet we go home and we clean our house or make ourselves dinner or do dishes. We're functionally doing work then. It's as opposed to being paid for it. We're relieving ourselves of the ability to pay someone else to do it. So it's silly to me, the people who stay at a job that they hate to make just enough money to retire, but then go home and do things they don't like to do so that they don't have to work anymore. That makes no sense either. I think ultimately we're really trading off how we fill our time, Mm. right? So we have a set amount of time. Time is not a commodity. It is set. We can't buy it. We can't sell it. We can't trade for it. All we can do is pretty much change what we do during that time, as well as play with some types of perception of time. But mostly all we can really do is how are we going to fill that time? What we need to do is be really intentional about the risks and rewards of what we choose to put in that time. And that's where I think we have to look at things over again. You can work at a job you don't like to make money, but then you're specifically putting something in that time slot that you will not enjoy. And so you can say that the money that you make will be worth it sometime in the future, such that you can later fill those time slots with things you like. So money is, in a sense, I like to call it potential energy. It's a way of storing 
the ability to control what things you do at, with your time. But that's only one way to look at it. And that can really go wrong because if you hate what you're doing, I truly believe that you shouldn't spend years and years doing what you hate what you're doing. So to me, that goes wrong if you hate what you're doing. It also goes wrong if you're unlucky enough to die young. Like my father died at 40. If he had spent the whole beginning of his career doing things he hated, which by the way, he didn't. But let's say he had thinking, I'm going to make a lot of money and then I'm going to enjoy myself at 45 when I retire. He would have never got there. Mm. So I think we have to be way more thoughtful about how we're spending our time. Now, no one knows when they're going to die. My dad had a premonition he was going to die young, but he couldn't have said it was going to happen at 40. I don't know how long I'll live, but we then can even use that information to decide how we want to spend our time. I always felt like I was going to live to a ripe old age. So I didn't mind working really, really hard, sometimes not really enjoying it at the beginning of my career because I didn't want to run out of money. So I knew I could make a lot of money when I was young. I didn't mind doing the work. Some people call it grinding away. I then took that money, put it in the stock market, let it compound because I felt pretty good about this idea that I'm going to live into my 80s or 90s. That worked for me. My dad, on the other hand, like I said, he had a premonition he was going to die young. So he took jobs he loved. Like he got his, he went through fellowship, became an oncologist. He was offered a very lucrative private practice job. Instead, he decided to stay with the university, work in the VA system where he made much less, Mm. but it was a job he adored. He had hobbies. He loved photography. He had, you know, a woodworking area in our basement and he made things. He was learning other languages. You know, my dad lived for the moment. Now, don't get me wrong. He got life insurance. He protected his family, but he wasn't really worried about saving for retirement because that wasn't part of his reality. Mm. So I think it's all about the trade-off. And so you've got to think about these trade-offs. I'm not saying you're going to get it right. I'm just saying you got to be intentional about it. Yeah. And, and I think that totally makes sense. And I think that's what your book really hammered home for me was just being intentional with this life that we, this one, you know, crazy life we get to live. Right. And, and, you know, I, I think that as people listen to this, like some of it's going to, it's going to remind, you know, the, the, the song, you know, like live as if you're dying. Right. Like this, this idea, like why, but why wait? Right. If not now, then when, like, I love that question. And, and, you know, it's, it's interesting how you weave that connection with money, which we feel obligated to make, to live a life that we don't even like sometimes. Right. And so, so talk to me, you have, you have a unique term for this. And so we've already covered some of it, but I, I want to hear you, you define it succinctly because I think it's one of the more interesting, uh, interesting terms that you use in the book, the money mind meld, right? So what is the money mind meld and how does it relate to people's ability to find that connection, to find that purpose? So I always think of the money mind meld as this sort of miasma in front of us that takes our eyes off the real goal. Right. So I think, again, we like to concentrate on money because it's simple and it's low hanging fruit. But ultimately, I think why we do that, the money mind meld is it protects us. Mm -hmm. It protects us from doing the really hard work of figuring out who we are and what's important to us and realizing that life is finite. And if we don't start figuring it out now, we may never. So instead, we make money kind of a a false goal. We set it up as the thing that's going to make us happy. And then we continuously pursue it. And we let it take up our thought process, sometimes for decades. And that way, we can avoid the tougher, deeper, more difficult questions. And so the money mind meld is a false goal. It's a way that simplicity confuses us and takes us away from the deeper meaning in life, which is to figure out who we are, what we want, how do we identify ourselves and what are the important connections in life? And so the dying are very good at showing us through the money mind meld again, because once you realize you have a finite amount of time left, you can't afford literally and figuratively to be worried about building a net worth anymore. You can't be worried about that bank account. You've got to really see through it because for once in life, concretely, your time is finite. So the money mind meld 
stops us from thinking about life being finite. It stops us from realizing that we are dying from the day we are born. It takes that away from our near vision to such an extent that we get caught up in things that are more tools than goals. And so my idea is to see through the money mind meld and get back to what those most important goals are, which I define in the book is purpose, identity, and connections. The three things that I really feel help us be our best selves. Yeah. And, and, and you, you have this really interesting way of getting us to that point. And, and actually I I've podcasted a lot about this, this idea it's in my book, as you know, as well. Um, and, and this idea of really, you know, enjoying the journey. Right. And this really resonated with me. And, and actually I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read this quote from this book that from your book, you know, taking stock. So when we evaluate our achievements in the rear view mirror, most of us realize that the joy wasn't surmounting obstacles, overcoming desperation, setting a plan and making progress or what happiness actually looks like. So you're asking us to take this, this transition from, you know, setting our sights on this end object, this, this, you know, thing that's way off on the horizon that we can never quite get to, you know, this, this ideal or, you know, and, and instead to put it on surmounting our obstacles, like it's actually the journey that we need to be enjoying. So what is, I, I really interested, maybe this might be my, my question. I'm most interested to hear you answer, Jordan. Like well, what has helped you learn how to do that, to focus on, you know, progress over the end product or, you know, and, and, and what should others learn from that? So the sentinel moment for me really was that day that I got Jim Daly's book because I looked at it and I realized that I had reached my goal. I had enough money. And yet that didn't bring me any new happiness. It didn't solve any of my problems. It didn't make me feel like I knew any better who I was or I, what I wanted. So I've done a lot of deep thinking about, well, if that wasn't what was going to truly and utterly make me happy, if that wasn't the purpose of life, what was? And I started realizing that it's something called the climb. And I'll, I'll first start by explaining that I say something funny to my kids. I often say to them, may you never reach your dreams, but may you get 95% of the way there. <laughs> okay. And the reason why I say that to them is there is a beauty in the climb. And I remember thinking this, especially when I was in medical school or residency, some of those years were the best years of my life because I was in the process of becoming and it felt so good to be making meaningful progress. Every day, I was fascinated by what I could learn and how I could grow. That was probably the closest thing I ever came to happiness up until an adult age in my 40s when I started questioning these things again. Uh. So it comes down to the fact that I think we need a climb, which is something that's deeply meaningful uh, full to us that relates to our purpose and identity. And then I think we need to feel like we're making progress. Like we need to feel like we're making some headway. That doesn't mean we have to get there. In fact, a lot of times I think the most perfect climbs are ones we can never 100% get to, but ones where we feel like we're continuously improving. And then last but not least, you've got to enjoy the path. Like time is finite. Instead of worrying about goals, which often we can't control. We may get there, we may not get there. But what if we could continuously move towards goals in which we enjoy the process of getting there? For me, my podcast is a perfect example. I want my podcast to be super successful. I want millions of people to download it. I want my end goal for it to be the number one business podcast out there. It's a great goal, but it's probably something that I can only control up to some point. On the other hand, I can go to every podcast interview and be hyped about who I'm interviewing. I can prepare in such a way that I feel like I'm creating the best conversation ever. And then I can have this wonderful conversation with someone I care about for an hour and just love it. That I can control. Like that's within my power. To me, that's what it's about. I want to spend my time doing those type of things Wherever I get to in popularity, however well that podcast does, in the end, none of that matters. But what does matter is that it 
it fulfilled my sense of purpose. It made me feel like I was building towards something important and I was making headway. And I think if we could make all of life feel that way, I think that's what, you know, we talk about Maslow's pyramid all the time. I think that's what he meant by self-actualization. You know, you got happiness researchers and they're always trying to define happiness and figure out how much money you need to make a year to get there. I mean, in a sense, I think that's what they're talking about when they're talking about life fulfillment and they're talking about contentedness. I mean, all those words I think ultimately mean doing something you feel is meaningful, enjoying the process and making headway. Yeah. So it's, it sounds like it's made of kind of two parts, right? So you, you've got the, the goal, the obstacle that is important to you, but the process of getting there and probably the more important part you're, you're getting at that process of getting there, it has to be something that you enjoy. And, and for me, I was surprised. I, I you know, I've, like our journeys have been so similar in terms of like, I like, I love medicine, but like the piece of medicine that I love the most is teaching. Like it's teaching. I mean, it always, it always is and always has been, and it always will be. I love teaching. And so, you know, I, I'm reading this, this idea of yours and, and about being on the climb. And for me, one of the things that helps me feel like I'm on the climb the most is actually what's quickly becoming no longer a side gig, but a main gig, right. In my business. And you talk about this. And so my two favorite topics, right. Money and mindset, and you kind of marry them here, right? You got the climb, but then you also talk about income diversification and, and how that's so important. And you've got this, this four-legged stool and, and, and the way that people can you know, create some safety in their financial lives. So for most doctors, I'm curious, because you know, I know our journey, but like, do you think financial diversification is important for every doctor? You know, and if so, how do they find that balance between creating diversification without driving themselves into the ground, right? Because you and I have both created businesses on the side while practicing a lot of medicine. And so getting on that climb without burning yourself out just entirely. So I think this is the classic mistake that I made and that we all make is we look at the finances first and then we go back and try to figure out the purpose, identity, and connections. So what I think the first step actually is put the financial stuff on hold briefly for a moment and think about what your true sense of purpose, identity, connections are. What is the climb that you want to fill your time, at least for the next decade? Because we don't know that climb can change. Things can change over time. But I think the first step is what is your climb? What are your purpose, identity, and connections? Once you've mapped that out, then I think we can walk over the financial conversation, which ultimately is the hardest part about writing this book was mirroring the two concepts. But I think once you figure out, once you do that first hard work, you can then say, okay, how am I going to financially build a framework that's going to support that purpose, identity, and connections? I'm a big fan of financial independence. You're a big fan of financial independence. I think the financial framework has to be a financial independence one, but there are a lot of different ways to get there depending on what your personality type is. So in the book, I talk about the story of the three brothers, right? And so they're three brothers and they each have a long path to take and they do it in very different ways. The first brother grinds his way through, even though he hates the path and gets there as fast as possible and arrives exhausted. But then he has a lot of time afterwards to enjoy himself. The second brother doesn't love his path either, but doesn't have as much stamina as the first brother. So We'll grind on for a while and then take a flight of fancy and go off into the woods, relax, re-energize, then come back and do that all the way until they get there. Maybe a little bit slower than the first brother, but still leaving relative amount of time. Then the last brother does something completely off the hook, takes his time, enjoys the path, takes forever to get to the end. But then when he gets there, he does something that neither the other brothers can understand. He turns around and walks back the way he came why do I tell the story of the three brothers? Because in a sense to me, those are the three different main roads to financial independence. The first way is that kind of financial independence retire early mantra that started this whole thing in the early 2000s, which is work really hard, maybe at a job you hate, make lots of money, invest it and retire at 40 or 35 or whenever you can get out. I think for some people, who have a purpose or identity that maybe will never make them a huge amount of money, 
that feel like they're going to live to a ripe old age of 80 or 90, that's a really good path. And if you know what your purpose and identity are, you can then decide whether that's right for you. Second brother, their path is much more things like passive income and side hustles, right? They're willing to work hard, but they need some of that income to come in now. They need the ability to take a mini retirement or take a sabbatical or break for a while. They can't go at it the way the first brother does. They're not sure, will I live long? Will I die early? I don't know. I need to be able to smell the roses now a little bit. So those people, again, can make those decisions. Maybe they do part-time emergency room work because they're an ER doctor, and then they start some side hustles on the side. Either way, it may take them a little bit longer to get to financial independence, but they're going to enjoy themselves more, and they're not going to burn out as fast. And then lastly, you have the youngest brothers, right? The youngest brothers tend to really love what they do. Maybe this is the person who started out like me, who thought that the only thing in the world was to be a physician, but then they get there and start practicing and they think it's the greatest thing in the world. Those people are kind of financially independent from day one because they make enough money to afford their monthly bills and at the same time are doing this thing that fulfills their sense of purpose, identity, and connections. My point here is it doesn't matter which brother you are, What really matters is that you understand what your true purpose and meaning are so that you can then evaluate which brother you want to be and set up a financial framework to support that. And then I think the only last question will be, are you afraid of dying early and never enjoying yourself? Or are you afraid of living long and running out of money? And the reason why that's important is if you're afraid of dying early, I don't care which brother you end up being. You probably want to save a little bit less and enjoy yourself a little bit more. You can still save 10% and reach financial independence at some point. But if you don't think you're going to live long, you know, live it up the way my dad did. And if you happen to be wrong, you'll eventually get to financial independence and you're going to have a great life. On the other hand, if you think that I'm going to make it till 95 and I'm worrying out of, worried about running out of money, then you might want to save 50%. You know, a little bit of deprivation may not be bad for you because then you can retire at 35 or 40 and you're going to have plenty of time to pursue your purpose and meaning and passions and identity. The point again is to put it in perspective. So if you are a young physician trying to figure this out, I say go back to purpose first, figure that out, and then take a look at your framework and let's decide which path works best for you or which mix of paths, right? Because you can grind it out a little bit and do some passive income and start putting things in place. Again, the idea is our problem is we don't think about these things now. We wait until we already reach that monetary goal. And especially with physicians who tend to burn out early, I'd love for them to start thinking about these things earlier so that they don't have to get to the point of burnout. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's such a refreshing thing about your book is that so many books that have anything to do with money tend to be pretty prescriptive. And, 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 and I'll, I'll, I'll argue that even my book, the, book, the first book that I wrote, was pretty prescriptive. And, and what you allow for in your allegory of the three brothers is some wiggle room, some freedom to... to base it on your passions and your personality. And, um, and as I was reading through them, I, I just, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Cause you've got the, you know, everyone talks about the, you know, the YOLO and you only live once and kind of live it up. And, and people talk about, no, you gotta, you know, eat ramen and, and save as much as you can so that you can live it up later. But nobody gives this like kind of shade of gray in the middle there of like the three brothers and their paths that all lead to, you know, different types of success. Um, whether that's in their passion or with, you know, the, the money that they are able to save and generate by working hard early. And, and, and I found that really interesting because especially nowadays, there's so much focus on work-life balance. And so, so many people are going to be transitioning from, I think, an older school, you know, first brother kind of narrative to a, a second or third, to be honest with you. And, and the workplace is having to reckon with that right now. It's, it's really interesting watching the workplace, you know, deal with people that want to be the second and third brother. So you started out your journey as the first brother. I guess I have two hypothetical questions uh, as, as I'm listening to you talk. If, if you could go back, do you think you'd do, you'd do it the same way? Like, would you, would you be the first brother again? Or, or would you choose the second or third knowing what you know now? It's funny because in parts of my path, I actually see myself as all of them. But it's always an interesting question, right? You say, 
if I could go back, would I have done things differently? Now, I have to tell you my mentality is I've decided personally, one of the parts about being happy of life is to look back and tell yourself the stories about your life that make you feel like the hero. Mm. So some of this might be my own personality, but I tend to think that I wouldn't be here today the way I am unless I went through what I went through. And thank God I did. And, you know, the first story that I had to really deal with was the story of my dad's death. So I could have looked at that in many ways. I could have looked at it as this horrible thing that had this horrible impact on me. But as I've gotten older, it's much easier and feels much better to look at it as my dad died so that I could step into his shoes so I could help people so I could learn Mm. all these things so that I could even eventually leave medicine, but use all that teaching and knowledge and information to help change people's lives by teaching them about finances or even writing this book. So it's hard to go back and say, I would change anything because I'm nothing but thankful for all those wonderful opportunities and experiences I got. Knowing what I would know now, I probably would have still become a physician. I probably would have gone to hospice immediately, and maybe I would have slowed down. I would have built the best life within that world as opposed to creating a separate life. Because now as I get older, I say, wow, I really like this work. Why didn't I start here? But I don't know if I had that perspective. Like I had to go out and do the general internal medicine thing. I had to run my own practice. I had to work at hospitals. I had to do all kind of these things, I think, to finally realize what I wanted. But it is funny because I I think I started out actually, I think I felt like I was the third or what I call the youngest brother in the book because I thought going into medicine was the passion play for me. Then I got burned out and I tried to be the second brother or the middle brother by like building all this passive income and these side hustles, et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, I got tired of all that and just made a lot of money being a doctor doing my primary job. So in a sense, I ended up as the eldest or first brother because I grounded it out, made a lot of money and invested it so I could get out. But I think that's part of the beauty about the whole thing is nothing means that you have to stay one course. You can pivot, you can change. Mm -hmm. In fact, I encourage you to change as soon as you realize that being living a life of purpose and identity for you means changing your direction, then it's time to change that direction. The problem is most people don't have those paths defined, so they know they need to change direction, but they don't have a roadmap in how to do that. Mm. And so I think that for me was the huge epiphany is there are these different paths And you can use them as necessary to make better use of your time today, not sometime in the future, not when you're financially independent, for sure, not when you're diagnosed with a terminal illness today. Yeah. And and, and I I think it's, gosh, it's so good, Jordan. When you think about this too, the question that naturally, because I know you, came to my mind. and, And first of all, let me back up and say, I love that thought, right? So like this, the entire point of this podcast and the reason why, you know, I record introductions after I record the show is because I always want there to be a thought that people take with them, right? A single thought that they might consider for a podcast episode. And and that thought that you just gave about telling the stories about your past that make you the hero, like telling your, your stories in such a way that that's how you interpret what has happened in your past. That's such a powerful thing. And I, I'm curious, as I was reading this book, knowing that you have kids, and the, the story of these three brothers and, and the past that they might take and the stories that your, your, your kids will have to be able to tell themselves about their own past. Like, how, how do you help them navigate that? Because I think that the road that you and I have gone, like people ask me all the time, like, are you going to you know, let your kid be an entrepreneur? Do you want to be a doctor? Do you like, you know, where, where are they going to shake out? Like what? And I know I, I, I answer that question, have answered that question differently as time has gone on. I'd be curious to know, like, when it comes to this, this, you know, parenting thing, uh, where where do you land with your kids on those conversations? Like, how do you encourage them and foster their growth? You know, it's interesting. I've thought a lot about this and and it was something I really struggled with too, because I look back at my own life and I think a lot about what I chose to do, what I didn't do, and more importantly, what I failed to have the courage to do. And a lot of the times 
I found my inner struggle was believing I was not enough personally, so I never even tried. So what I actually tell my children and what I even tell myself and tell other people all the time is you are enough already and nothing you do today or tomorrow is going to change that. So if you begin the conversation with you are enough, and I do this with my kids a lot, it really starts making the future look very different, right? Because you take away their need to prove themselves or define themselves by already telling them they're enough. And then instead say, the world is your playground, dabble, learn. You know, you don't have to take my path. You don't even have to care about financial independence, but I do want you to connect with this idea that you control how you spend the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, hopefully 70 or 80 years. Don't let go of that control. Think about it, plan it, look to the future as your oyster, your playground. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of the time that spans in front of you. Instead, put it to a use that feels like it's doing something for you. And mm. so that's how I really think about it with my kids. And I, I, I think that's a, a big message that comes out of this is, you know, you mentioned that a lot of times money books feel prescriptive. And the reason are is because they're about one thing, getting enough money. What I think when we broaden the conversation out to living a life that feels fulfilling and understanding your own purpose, identity, and connections, you know, it's not prescriptive and there have to be lots of options. So when I look at my kids, I start thinking about how can you look all these options in the face and instead of being afraid of them, dive in head first. I love it. Well, hey, Jordan, if people want to read your book, they want to learn about all these concepts that we just talked about in this show and all of the wisdom and pearls of knowledge that you drop in that book. Where can they find it and how can they find uh, more things and more ideas and concepts from you? So the book is Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth and Living a Regret-Free Life is available everywhere, whether that be Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Wherever you buy books, especially online, you can find it there. It is available as of August 2nd by Ulysses Press, but it will be available for pre-sale before then. You can learn more about me at jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. That is like the hub for everything I do. So you can learn about the book there. You can learn about medical blogging, financial blogging, as well as my podcast. There are links to all of that. Uh, if you want to listen to the Earn and Invest podcast, probably the place I spend most of my time, that's earnandinvest.com. We talk about next level financial discussions, not how do you put money into a Roth IRA or 401k, but more like, okay, I'm starting to understand this money thing. What now? And so that's the Earn and Invest podcast. I love it, Jordan. Well, hey, thank you so much for sharing your ideas and your book with us. Uh, I, I highly recommend it for everybody to go and Check it out and read uh, your book. It's it's it was hugely impactful for me, and I know it will be for everyone listening as well. So thanks for uh, thanks for sharing your wisdom. It's a pleasure, Zoe. Thanks for having me on the show. Start before you're ready. Start by starting. Start now. 